Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Beth, an alcoholic, and thanks to the grace of God, the steps and fellowship of AA and sponsorship, I've been sober since June 26, 1988, and I'm very grateful for that. feel like I should talk slow for 15 minutes so the people who are coming at 8 o'clock for the 8 o'clock meeting don't miss anything. I'd hate to have to start over at 8, but I was telling Anda they taught me 20 minutes early is on time, so I would have been here for me, and good for all of you who are. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I won't mention the speeding ticket that she got doing 100 on the way, <laughs> but we were immediately kindred spirits. It took us 10 minutes to get from the airport to the hotel here. Uh, <laughs> With the aid of a GPS, so. <laughs> All I will say is that her GPS lies. <laughs> it's good to be here. I've already met another kindred soul. He told me there was water up here. I said, I carry my own. I still just can't get past using a square bottle. And he said, of course, they don't roll out from under the car seat. And I said, exactly. <laughs> I drank wild Irish Rose and Jack Daniels for the same reasons. <laughs> Because it's inconvenient when it comes rolling out when you even stop. So, anyway, it's good to be here. It's always an honor to be asked to participate in Alcoholics Anonymous. I want to thank Dennis and the committee, and especially for being understanding. Because I'm kind of passing through today, and and uh, I'm sure many of you knew Dick M from Bellevue, Nebraska, and his memorial services tomorrow. His wife is my sponsor and has been for 20 years. So. I'll be going to Omaha tomorrow morning to attend his memorial service, so I, I hate that I will miss the rest of the weekend, but I'm uh, I'm honored to be here with you for the short time that I am. Um, I never know where to start. I drank a lot. That's probably as good a place as any. <laughs> I um, Well, let's see. How many people here are in their first year of sobriety and were not happy about it when you got here? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I used to love when Vincio would say, if you're new, we already know a lot about you. We know 2015 has not been a good year. So. <laughs> but I, uh, I went to my first AA meeting in 1966. I was seven years old. My dad got sober in Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, I grew up in Oxford, Ohio, and that was my first resentment. I didn't want to be from Ohio. I was pretty mad about it. Um, I found out I was born in Northern California, so I was supposed to be a California girl and uh, was moved against my will at age two to Ohio. <laughs> and uh, I still think I might have made it as a California girl. I mean, you know, I got it. So I, uh, but I, you know, I found out it was warm other places all year. That appealed to me greatly. And I just, you know, I was in first grade, the first day of school, looking at a map of the United States and seeing California where I was supposed to be and the, all the oceans in the Gulf and Texas and Florida, and, and then there was Ohio. And I can remember looking at a map and thinking, you can look at a map and tell that nothing is happening in Ohio. <laughs> and I was six, you know? I mean, where does that come from? I, I mean, now I know that at age six, I was already restless, irritable, and discontent. At age six, I already was looking for an outside fix to an inside problem. If I lived somewhere else, if I had a brother, if I had a sister, if my mom looked more like the other moms of my, you know, if, 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 if I had this, then I'd be okay. If I had this, it would be different. If I had this, it would be happy. And if you had asked me what was wrong with me, I couldn't have told you, you know, at six, you can't articulate that you're suffering from a spiritual malady that only a spiritual experience can conquer. <laughs> you know, I just thought I hated Ohio. And, uh, but I, you know, I, I went to meetings. I was the kid in the corner of the open speaker meeting Friday nights in Hamilton, Ohio, because my dad got sober and they couldn't afford a sitter every Friday. So I would, you know, take my coloring book. And it was a lot more anonymous back then because they smoked indoors. So by the time you got up to table, hey, everybody disappeared. <laughs> but for the most part, I knew AA was full of old guys who drank coffee and ate donuts because I saw it every Friday. I mean, my God, my dad was like almost 40 by then. And, uh, <laughs> So I really, and, and then as I got older, I knew AA had something to do with not drinking, and that didn't really interest me much. So, and when I did start to drink, you know, my dad told me all the, the drama and tragic losses of his drinking. And if he ever told me he had fun, I don't remember hearing it. Uh, he might have. Uh, I wasn't the best listener. Um, 
But, you know, when I drank, I had a good time, and I just thought if he had drank more like me, he could have hung in there longer, you know? I just I just felt bad for him. Um, but, you know, when I did, I did, I wasn't somebody who came to AA, you know, when I finally said I was an alcoholic. I did not walk through the doors and go, thank God I'm home, you know? I just want what everybody has, and I'm so happy to be here. I I did not want to be here. I tried everything to stay out of AA. I, I tried everything. And I, I had about a five-year period where I would did what I... I never was one of those people who would come get a month or two or three and then drink a beer. I would come get a week or two and then drink a year. Uh, <laughs> you know, I would pretty much go through treatment to stay out of jail, you know, behave myself for a week or two till the heat was off, and then I was gone again for another year. And so I just, it's kind of my drive-by AA period. Um, and when I pass through, I mean, I've always been in a... I hate to say intellectual. Well, I'm a test taker. That's what, It's not necessarily intellectual. You just... If you're a test taker, you know who you are. You know, a test taker, we can read anything, spit it back on a test, get the A, and not know what we read 20 minutes later. So you can ace treatment if you're a test taker. Um, Dennis said something about being a type A personality. And uh, my husband, who's an MSW, looked at me one day and said, you know, you're a type AL personality. And uh, like an idiot, I asked him what that meant. Ellen's down here cracking up because she knows what it means. Um, he said, well, I, I said, okay, I'll bite. What's a type AL? And he said, well, I have no doubt that you're a type A personality, but you're lazy enough that you're not annoying. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. Um, so I wasn't real big on doing anything that involved work necessarily. If I hadn't been a test taker, I would not have had the grades in school because it would have required work, and I'm not very interested in that. Um, but I heard him talk about being self-centered when I passed through, and I always thought that self-centered meant vain and selfish. And I never really th thought I was either of those. Ask me, I would tell you I'm the most loving, giving person I know. And... Uh, <laughs> You know, it, it, it took until I came and stayed, and, and over the years it's, it's kind of changed. But what I've come to understand is that what I didn't know then is that I didn't know self-centered meant if I can't win, I don't want to play. And I didn't know self-centered meant that you will never see me try something new in public because you might see me fail. You know, I didn't know self-centered meant if I walk in a room and two people back there lean their heads together and laugh, I know they're talking about me. I didn't know self-centered meant you will never see me try anything new ever in public, you know. I didn't know self-centered meant if I wasn't good at it by the third time, I just didn't do it. Like my friends who could play the piano, I never put together that they were the ones who couldn't come out and play because they had piano lessons and they had to practice. I just thought, well, nice for you that you can play the piano, you know, because school was kind of an instant thing for me, and I think I just thought everything should be. And so, I, you know, I lived my life self-centered. And when I came in and the big book says... We do this inventory and we find that the world and its people dominated us. I didn't get that either because I was in a, I mean, I, I was a biker. I ran with very tall people, you know, that, that wore leather and drank. And, and I, for whatever reason, I never was in physically abusive relationships. And, uh, and I never fought, not out of any high moral ground, but out of a total fear of getting humiliated in public. And because uh, I knew, like, if I hit you, you would hit me back. It would hurt. I would cry and look so bad. So, I mean, I am like, uh, the only thing I think that saved me from hopeless drug addiction is a fear of needles so bad that I still can't even look when I get a flu shot. I'm just like, tell me when you're done, and I want a sticker. <laughs> he got a sticker. He's four, Beth. I don't care. <laughs> but I, you know... So I didn't really understand what it meant when it said the world and its people dominated us. And, and what I've come to understand is what dominated me is what you thought of me. But the whole time that what you, dominate, what you thought of me dominated me, I thought I didn't care what you thought of me. If you had asked me, I would tell you, I don't care what you think of me. You know, I mean, for the most part, when we come in, most of us, we're going like, help me. You know, I, mean, <laughs> I don't like you. I don't need you. Why aren't you talking to me? You know, if you shake my hand, I'll break your arm, but please talk to me. And, um, and uh, you know, I know now that what dominated me was what you thought of me. Because you will hear self-esteem tossed about, and it's even in the book, you know, in the, the example on the inventory. But if you really read it, you know, I, I love, God bless Joe and Charlie, because they made the, that example human. 
you know, and that guy's self-esteem, you know, Brown may get my job at the office, self-esteem. Well, of course, because, like, the only reason my wife is hanging around is because I have a paycheck. And if he gets my job, I'm going to look bad. I mean, that whole inventory is I'm going to look bad. And what dominated me is what you thought of me and what you thought, like, what I thought of myself. My self-esteem has nothing to do with how I feel about myself. My self-esteem doesn't have much to do with how you feel about me. My self-esteem has everything to do with what I think you think about me. And if you understand that, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> because if you think I'm okay, then I'm okay. So who do I have to get? Who do I have to be? Where do I have to work? What do I have to wear? You know, what do I have to drive? Because if I look okay to you, then you think I'm okay, then I'm okay. So what I found was my entire life, I was trying to arrange your perception of me so that I could be okay. Because I never felt okay in my own space. I never thought, I mean, I was, I was an only child. We always lived next door to a big family. And I would just go absorb myself into their household where there was noise. Because even at five and six years old, if I was alone, I was in unfriendly territory. I had a whole chorus of voices in my head. None of them liked me. I couldn't find one friendly voice in my own head. They all told me things at age five and six, like, nobody likes you, you know. They're, they just play with you because their mom makes them. You know, they're all laughing about when you fell down playing kickball three years ago, you know. <laughs> they're still talking about it. And, uh, and so I just couldn't be by myself. My favorite promise in the book to this day is the one that says we can be alone at perfect peace and ease. Because uh, followed immediately by we can look the world in the eye. Because I couldn't do either of those ever until I got here. I just couldn't. And, uh, and so I was busy, you know, before I drank, cause I didn't know I needed a drink. Um, or I probably would have took one earlier. My husband says he white knuckled it till he was 12 and then he needed a drink. He took one. And, uh, if I'd been smarter, I probably could have saved myself a lot of heartache and headaches, but I didn't drink till I was 15. So I was a joiner instead. I was just busy, 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 you know? And so by the time I'm in eighth grade, I'm on the yearbook staff, honor society, pep club, band, you know, um, student council. I mean, you name it, I was doing it. And at the end of my freshman year in high school, I took a drink and, um, you know, the sky didn't light up. I didn't get falling down drunk because some of my friends were experimenting with alcohol by then and they were falling down and throwing up and that looks bad. I'm not doing that. And, uh, but I put on enough of a glow that I took my best friend out the next day to drink with me. So I'd have somebody to drink with. And our friendship didn't last another year because we drank different from the start, you know, if I had had daily access, I would have been a daily drinker at age 15. The only thing that kept me from daily drinking was just not having it in the house because my dad was in a stupid AA. So, uh, and my mom drinks like two drinks and gets sleepy. I don't know what's wrong with her. I keep telling her, you just have to push through that. And she, just, <laughs> she just can't do it. She's unwilling. <laughs> Lightweight. So... Uh, so anyway, you know, as soon as I drank, all of that stuff went away. I didn't need it anymore. And some of it I gave away. Some of it I threw away. Some of it got taken away. And some of it just slid away unnoticed. And, you know, there have been whole pieces of my life I got back in sobriety that I didn't even know were gone. I grew up in a college town, Oxford, Ohio, where Miami University is. And it was a clean, safe, Midwestern town, great place to grow up. I was going to college sporting events at six years old. My friends and I could just walk to the game by ourselves. And by the time I was done, you know, at the end of my drinking, I was sitting in a bar watching the game, talking about going to the game someday. But I, you know, I, my world just got smaller and smaller. And after I got sober and Chuck and I got married, he got his degree from University of Cincinnati and they gave you football tickets with your diploma, which just to the first game, which we figured out later is because they were on the quarter system. So the students weren't there till the end of September. <laughs> And they wanted somebody in the stands at the first game because they were 0-12 a lot. And uh, you had to really love football to be from Cincinnati for a really long time. Um, so anyway, we go to the game, and we go early because we've been trained to show up early. And the band is warming up, and the cheerleaders are running around. All of a sudden, I realize I just have tears rolling down my cheeks because here's this whole piece of my life that I had just gotten back that I didn't even know was gone. So I did, there have been so many things I've gotten here that I never would have asked for. And, you know, when you're new, I know it seems like a lot of stuff is cliche, but 
you know, one of the big ones is they, they said, and I was like, yeah, whatever. You know, if you make a list of what you want when you're new, it's you're, you're really going to, like, shortchange yourself. And, and my list when I got here had three things on it. I wanted my driver's license back. I wanted to stop getting arrested. And I wanted maybe someday, maybe, to remarry, preferably to a guy that had a job this time. And, <laughs> It just never came up at last call, you know. I, I, uh, I should. <laughs> oh, like you didn't date at last call. <laughs> That's where I dated. <laughs> I lived by two principles. One was it's not all right not to know. Don't ever ask a question, or everyone will know that you don't know. And the other principle was uh, just never, ever, ever, ever let anyone know you have made a mistake ever. Do not admit when you were wrong. So I had a one-night stand drag into a five-year marriage, living that one out. Um, another one of those tragic last call meetings that just lasted way too long. So I used to say there never should have been a second date, but there wasn't. I mean, it really, he had a keg party, and I just never left. I needed somewhere, <laughs> I needed somewhere to live. I was going to have to go back to Ohio, so... Ugh. So anyway, start drinking, immediate changes, you know, grades plunge, friends change, everything, the Al-Anon thing. Do they still have that? Is your child doing this, 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 and this? Yeah, I was doing it all, but for whatever reason, I just kind of skated. But there, there were just drastic changes in my first year drinking. And I got out of high school probably based on the fact that I didn't drink the first year and I had a lot of credit stacked up. I went off to college because that's what you do. I flunked out of college because that's what you do when you don't go to class. And... um And it's not that I was partying a lot at school, but I, you know, I had somehow, I didn't do my research, and I plopped myself into the center of a 21 state, um, which was stupid back then because there were 18 states all the way around. But I'm in a 21 state. And the other thing, it took me to 17 years sober to go, as bad as I wanted out of the Midwest, why in God's name did I go to Indiana University? (laughs) I just, I went 100 miles due west. And, uh, but there you go. I might have made it somewhere else. We'll never know. Um. But I couldn't go to class because I didn't have access to alcohol there. And when I meet somebody, if I don't have a beer in my hand, my conversation skills are done with high I'm Beth. I mean, you know, I don't know what to say next. And if I meet you, I say, hi, I'm Beth. And she'll say, hi, I'm Ellen. Well, no, she'll say, hi, I'm Ellen. <laughs> and I'll be like, <laughs> I know it's my turn to talk, you know? I mean, I, the whole committee is now convened discussing what we should be talking about. You say something, she's staring at you. You look stupid. You're going to look dumber if you talk. What if you say something dumb? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And so it's like they're all arguing. I am just paralyzed. We have to go. And uh, so that pretty much sums up my college career. And uh, so I went back to Ohio, of course, knowing the entire town had seen my disgrace and, and was watching, you know, because I'm not self-centered or anything. So I got a job in a bank because that seemed like the next most respectable thing to do after college. And banks work Monday mornings, so banking was a short career. And, <laughs> and uh, a friend of mine had a friend in Florida, and he said, we should go to Florida. And I said, we should. And 24 hours later, we were in Bonita Springs, Florida. I had finally found a way to run away from home. I'd wanted to run away since I was 12. Literally, I'm always so embarrassed to tell you this, literally all the way through the state of Kentucky, I was looking at the rearview mirror waiting for the sheriff to come pull us over and make me go home because I'm a runaway. So two weeks after I get there, now I get a job in a convenience store like a 7-Eleven because I'd worked in one in Ohio. I didn't know it was so transient down there that if you went to work three days in a row, you were management material. So <laughs> so when I call mom two weeks later, I'm like, well, I'm in South Florida, but don't worry, I'm assistant manager at this store. And she, you know, she said, Beth, why, why, why didn't you just tell us you were going? And I thought that was stupid since I had run away. That kind of defeats the purpose. And uh, there's it. you ever tell somebody like your mom or a policeman, you know, what, what you really think? And there's just crickets on the other hand. And so I, I mentioned that I had run away from home, and that would really defeat the purpose of doing so. And, and she just, she's like, honey, honey you're... You're 19, you could have just moved. (laughs) Who knew that? I don't ask questions, you know. So now I'm in Florida as a 19-year-old runaway. I am, like, really hitting a big time. 
by the end of eight months, you know, it was a little town. The whole town was three miles long. Bonita Springs was tiny in 1978. And I have found my people down there because the town is three miles long. People down there bought beer on this end of town to drink on the way to the bar on this end of town. If you need a six-pack to drive three miles, you are my people. And uh, so by the end of eight months, I'm running out of, like, places to work, and I'm running out of people to date because there's only three bars in that town. And I told you where my dating pool was last call. So I was going to maybe have to violate rule number two, admitting that I had made a mistake because I was going to have to go back to Ohio, and, and then as luck would have it, a guy moved to town from California and saved the day. Um, you know, he had everything I was looking for in a man. He had a house, a car, and a job. And, uh, or so it seemed. I didn't do my research. <laughs> and he was 6'2 with tattoos and a Harley. So there you go. Uh, love at first beer. And uh, <laughs> so that, as I said, dragged on into a five-year marriage. We had two kids in that marriage. We, you know, went to California. We went back to South Florida. We went to the Keys. You know, same thing. We went to the Keys, 4th of July weekend, liked it, came home Tuesday, moved Friday with a six-month-old baby and 400 bucks. Hey, Mom, moved to the Keys. I was 10 years sober. My mom is still writing my address in pencil. <laughs> I was like, Mom, I just bought a house. I said I was going to stay somewhere for years, and she's like, pencil, you know. So, But I'm like, hey, moved to the Keys. Don't worry, though. I'm assistant manager at this restaurant. And she just, you know, she said something to me, which it just made her crazy. She said, how can you do something this stupid and land on your feet? It just made her nuts. And I did. It did not matter what I got into. I just skated out of it. I was like that cartoon guy that's walking down the sidewalk and the safes and the pianos are crashing behind them, you know. That, that was me. Every now and then I might get clipped, but I never got crushed like I should have. The only day I ever got suspended from school for drinking, it snowed that night and there was no school. So my record's clean, you know. <laughs> And things like that are why I'm not in prison. They get so happy for me in prison when I tell those stories. But, uh, I mean, I should, I should have been in prison, really, for a very long time. But, you know, mistakes were made, and, and I skated like I always did. So uh, that happened again in the Keys because it was expensive to live down there. And so we started a little home-based business, you know, a little extra money, part-time job, my thoughts, um, you know. The detective was very quiet when I told her it was a part-time job, and uh, she said, no, we call that sale of a controlled substance, Beth. So, but again, mistakes were made, and, and you know, I walked out of that with a couple years of probation. They thought it was all his fault, and I wasn't going to tell him that it wasn't. You know, he, he did not have the business sense to run a small business, but I wasn't going to tell them that, you know. I'm the accountant in the family, so... But, you know, and I thought I'd love that job in the Keys. I became the night auditor, Beth the night auditor, because I always had to be Beth something, Beth the cheerleader, Beth Jim and Sally's daughter, Beth the night auditor, because just being Beth is not enough ever. You know, so now I'm Beth the night auditor. I'm in this place in the upper Keys. Like the older dignified money went down the road to the other place. We got all the drug money from Miami. It was beautiful, beautiful place. Seven bars, three restaurants. When I became the night auditor, they gave me the keys to all seven bars, and they paid me quite possibly still the best job I have ever had. <laughs> and at night, I would go close out this bar and have a drink with them, and then close out this bar and have a drink with them, and then we would lock the six-floor restaurant up. And, I mean, all the security guards there were bikers. It just couldn't, I mean, it just can't get any better than that, you know. And uh, we would lock the doors up there and, and, and you'd drink a few and do a few other outside issues that were prevalent in the Keys and and, you know, and they paid me. Um, and one day I went to happy hour at five and I was still there six hours later when I was supposed to be clocking in. So they fired me and I intuitively knew that I was not going to find a job quite like that anywhere else where I got paid to drink all night. So I, uh, I went to an AA meeting in the Keys. I went to the Tuesday night Key Largo group of Alcoholics Anonymous. Because I had been to meetings with my dad, you know, as an adult, when I went home to visit, he would always take me to a meeting with him. I thought it was nice. He wanted me to meet his friends, you know. And now I know he's probably just going, oh, God, please let her hear something. But, you know, we would go around the room, and he'd say, my name's Jim, I'm an alcoholic. And I would say, my name's Beth, I'm with him. Because um, when you have a sober parent, I've, I've heard speakers say they sat in the bar and said, oh, I'm alcoholic, who cares? And if you have a sober parent, that's a game changer. You know, I intuit it. You just never heard me say the A word in the same sentence with my name. 
Because I intuitively knew if I ever linked them together in a sentence that a big book would drop out of the sky and the bartender would hand me a meeting schedule and it would, you know, the AA police would just come cart me away to a meeting. So I never wondered if I was alcohol. I might be not mixing those anymore, you know, um, or I'll slow down. I'll just, I'm not drinking today. I'll just have a beer, you know, <laughs> no whiskey. Um, and I, you know, but I went to this meeting. I said I was an alcoholic. They were very nice. I mean, uh, you know, Heaven's waiting room down there. Everybody's, I mean, they were like 50 down there, 60. They were old, 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 old. And I, I'm 24, you know. The meeting's over at 930. They invite me to Perkins because that's what they do. Do they have Perkins here? Denny's? Okay, same thing. So now I'm like 24 years old. It's 930 at night. I've got a Harley Davidson parked out there. Did I mention it's 9.30 at night? And I've been invited to Perkins. <laughs> yeah, sobriety's rocking now. <laughs> 9.35, gosh. Should I kill myself now or get pancakes first? <laughs> but, you know, another piano crashed by. I went and made an appointment with my ex-boss, told him I knew I had a problem and I was going to AA, and... As it turned out, they had put the weekend girl up to full-time. She didn't want to work full-time, and everybody hated her. So, you know, one AA meeting, I get my job back. AA works, it really does. <laughs> I went to the Friday night Key Largo group of Alcoholics Anonymous and told them I got my job back, and that was that was pretty much the end of my AA and the Keys. But I did call Dad and tell him I went to a meeting, and within a week I got a box from my dad, which was unusual because I didn't get mail from him much. We would just talk on the phone. And I got a box from Dad, and it had a big book, a 12 and 12, each day a new beginning, 24 hours a day, one day at a time, a cassette tape of his talk, a few of the pamphlets. <laughs> I don't know how many years he had been tossing stuff in the box. <laughs> one meeting, and that box is in the mail. And uh, So now I got my AA book, which I never threw away. If you're new, buy a hardcover book. There's some, you just can't throw them away. I mean, if he'd sent me a paperback, it would have been long gone. But there's something about a hard, at least if you're 50 or over, there's something about a hardcover book. I guess that would be a Kindle. Who knows? But, you know, I just, I kept it for whatever reason. And I ended up back in Ohio because I wanted to divorce. Well, I really wanted to divorce since before I got married. But I can't, <laughs> you know, I mean, three weeks into that relationship, I, a little voice said, like, not a good idea. But if I had said, this isn't a good idea, he might have said something like, why are you living at my house then, you know, and then I would have had to go back to Ohio. So I just did my best Scarlett O'Hara, like, I'll worry about that tomorrow. And then five years later, I still wanted out, and uh, but it had to be his fault, because if I leave, then it's my fault. You know, I have ended the marriage. So finally, finally, he said, get out. He only had to say it once. I called mom as soon as he left for work. I should, in hindsight, it's kind of odd he even had a job. That was unusual, but he left for work. I called mom, said, you know, he's throwing me out. Can you send me some money? She said, no, <laughs> but I will send you a plane ticket. So I found myself back in Ohio in 1984. And on the way back, I thought, okay, fine, maybe, maybe I should try AA. But I really thought if I just quit drinking with bikers, life would calm down, you know. So she lived in one of those neighborhoods that's kind of stepped off the pages of an L.L. Bean catalog. And uh, I went and drank in her neighborhood, and, you know, nothing turned out any better there. And uh, and I got to say, too, in, in 1984, I mean, I was 25 years old. I'm 56 now, for those of you who count like I do, so you don't have to lose any more time counting. Um, so, you know, in 1984, Ikipa had just been in Cincinnati in 1983. So they had a Monday Night Young People's meeting in 1984 that was 200 people. And they had a Friday Night Live group that was young people that was 150 people. And it was excited, active, enthusiastic, sponsored, structured Alcoholics Anonymous. But when I walk in a big room full of people, it tends to split into two groups. All of you and me. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know what to say after my name's Beth at an AA meeting any more than I do when I walk in anywhere else. Because you guys are all talking to each other and you all know each other and I don't. And, you know, I, I might have given you my name, although it's, you know, because it seemed like nobody was remembering my name, but I might not have told you because who wants to be new, you know. And plus I would come, the meetings were at 8.30, I'd come at 8.29, I'd be out there at 9.31, you know. I always had a sponsor. She didn't always know she was my sponsor, but I always had a sponsor. <laughs> so if you ask me, I could point. And, uh, but I just, you know, I just couldn't do it. And I, I mean, I tried to. I did. I know I gave it 
a good two weeks. I'm sure of it. And uh, and then I just found a bar where my people were because if I have five bucks, I'm good for the night. I know who can drink as much as me. I know who shoots pool as well as me. And I know who knows where the party is when the bar closes. Because from the beginning, I could drink with the big boys, so I did. I had a huge capacity for alcohol. I loved to drink. Loved to drink. Loved it. Morning drinking, I mean, why wouldn't you? You know, my, I mean, my day my day just went better. If I could, The earlier I started, the better my day went. And, uh, and you know, I drank with the big guys because I could. And, uh, and so when I got to AA and the first thing they say is hang out with the women, I was just horrified because... I mean, I've, I didn't even drink with women, and you want me to hang out with them sober? I mean, you know. <sighs> well, you know, in high school when the girls start drinking, it's just embarrassing. I mean, they, you know, they giggle, and they fall down, and they throw up, and everybody likes the same boy. And later there's husbands, and that gets confusing on whose is whose sometimes. And it just it's it's so much easier to just drink with the guys and you know <laughs> girls are I mean they wear pink in public um you know I said that one night and everybody's silent and I looked down I was wearing a pink dress I was like oh my god <laughs> when did that happen so I was telling somebody the other day I would not have talked to me when I got sober I uh women they they you know I mean I know the truth now women just terrified me they fell into three categories either they were of no consequence they were competition or somebody look at me and I knew she could see right through me and you got to avoid those people, you know? And so I just went on my merry way without making eye contact much. And I moved back to Ohio and within a year, my children were removed from my custody because they were in bed. They were one and three and, uh, and I had nothing to drink in the house and I had to drink. Now I didn't know I had to drink. I thought I wanted to drink. There was a bar four doors down. So I just walked down to the corner to get a drink, which was several drinks. And, uh, my three-year-old son woke up and couldn't find me. And he came outside onto the front porch, and it was a step down out the front door, so he couldn't reach the door handle to get back in. And it's just a grace of God that he didn't go try to find me. But he stood on the porch and cried, and the neighbors called the police. And the police didn't have a hard time figuring out where I was. My car was parked right in front, and there was a bar four doors down. wonder where she could be. So they called the bar and asked if I was there and suggested that I come home. And then they said, is there anyone we can call to get your children? And I'm thinking, well, I'll never hear the end of this if they call my mother. So I said, no. I guess I thought they'd go, oh, and leave. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I said, no, not really. And they said, okay, we'll have to call 241 Kids. And I went, oh, wait, my mother lives here. So, um, you know, she got that middle-of-the-night call that no mother wants to get. Come get your grandchildren. Your daughter's under arrest. And at 51 years old, with one phone call after midnight, my mom's life got turned upside down. She became the single parent of a one-year-old and a three-year-old with absolutely no warning because I, you know, I was arrested. And then they said, if you go to treatment, you might not go to jail because that was an automatic six months for child endangerment. So treatment seemed like a good plan. I found a treatment center that took my no insurance. Um, it was all women, and it was six weeks long. God's cosmic joke on me. And, uh, but I have my big book from my dad and I have a tape of his talk if you'd like to hear it. And I've underlined a few things if you want to see what I found interesting, you know. And I was the one they would come get to talk to other women who didn't want to leave their children for six weeks. And I, could, I can say all the right things. I would tell them better six weeks now than forever later. Because if we're not sober, we won't be parents at all. But the big book talks about a double life. The one we know is true and the one we want the world to see. And what was happening the longer I was in there was I realized that I didn't really want my kids back. It was too hard being a single parent. And I knew I wasn't done drinking. I knew that. And I could not be a single parent and drink. And at my mom's house, those kids got to daycare and clean clothes on time, having had breakfast. And they got dinner at dinner time, age-appropriate food. They slept in clean sheets. They got a bath every night. She read them a story every night, despite the fact that her life had been turned upside down in an instant. She was a better parent than I ever could have been, and I knew it. And I wasn't grateful to her. I hated her for it because she was making me look bad because that's what alcoholism does. It drained, I don't know about you, it drained me of the ability to feel compassion or gratitude for anything. Every problem I'd ever had, starting from moving to Ohio at age two, I had laid at my mother's feet. And the kind of daughter I am with untreated alcoholism, I can sum up in one example, which I didn't do on a weekly basis, but one is one time too many. 
my kids, I was now living in the, oh, the other thing that happened while I was in that treatment center is my dad died and I was going to go be sober with him. So that, you know, that plan was shot and I'm the only child of divorced parents. So I got the insurance money and that let me drink the way I wanted to drink for the next two and a half years. And those kids stayed at my mom's house. And I was staying in a friend's attic. I used to say I moved into an attic apartment, and then I realized I didn't move into an attic apartment. It was an attic. Um, <laughs> there was nothing up there until my furniture went up there. And, uh, you know, the kids came over for a weekend because my friend who had the house, she had a daughter about the same age. And on Sunday afternoon, I mentioned to the kids that I might be able to start looking for an apartment soon so we could live together again, knowing that it wasn't true but knowing that they would get so excited they would go home and tell Grandma all about it and she would have to be the bad guy and talk them down. That's what I did to my mother. That's what I set up while I'm saying, I'm not hurting you, butt out. It's my business, you know? I mean, we the stuff we do to our families, I had scorched earth all the way around me while I was busy flying my flag. I'm not hurting anybody but me, you know? Um, it's been a long path back to a relationship with my mother that's you know how do you make amends for that and uh so anyway it wasn't until the money ran out that I got sober in uh, early 1988 I woke up well toward the end of 1987 I just kind of crashed in this emotional wall and said I can't live like this God and you got to do something and I meant take me out of my sleep you know the reason I never attempted suicide is I knew I would live and that was you know and probably be maimed and look bad so suicide was off the table and uh you know I mean I had friends that had shot themselves and lived and it just it's you know people talk behind your back so <laughs> uh, can you take that off Gary <laughs> So I'm talking to God and uh, just said, I can't do this anymore. And I remembered the big book my dad had sent all those years before. And I went and I dragged it out of the box because it was still in a box. And I read Bill's story, which I'd read every time I went through treatment because you go to treatment and they say the design for living is in this book. And I never read the Roman numerals. I mean, who reads those except the suck-ups in treatment? So, you know, I get in there ready for my directions for living and open up to page one and it would say war fever ran high in a New England town. I'd be like, oh yeah, this is helpful, you know. <laughs> Bring it home, Bill. And uh, But that night, for the first time, I identified with Bill Wilson and I felt how he felt and I knew what he meant. And I slept with the big book like it was a teddy bear, and I slept well for the first time in a long time. And when I woke up the next morning, I did not want to drink. You know, God had removed that obsession to drink, and it's not the first time. There, are, I can see three or four times that God had removed the obsession to drink. But I did then what I did the other three or four times, which was nothing. I didn't pray. I didn't go to a meeting. I didn't read anything else. I didn't call anybody. And, you know, God will take that obsession to drink away every time I ask him. But I, you know, there's a difference between surrendering and staying surrendered. And staying surrendered was the piece I was missing. You know, to put it in simpler terms, I can fill up my gas tank, but if I only fill it up in December, it is not going to carry me anywhere in February. And that is kind of how I did my surrenders. I would surrender in December, but then nothing else happened. And so, I don't know, a week, a day, I, the committee convened, determined that we were going to drink anyway, may as well get it over with. And... um so I drank, but the, the beginning of 1988 was just weird. By now I'm drinking in the Dewdrop Inn in uh, Norwood, Ohio, the Dewdrop Cafe. Dewdrop Inn, God, I can't believe I can't remember the name of that place. I didn't think that would ever happen. Anyway, I'm drinking in Norwood, Ohio, garden town of Cincinnati, and, um, and the bartender's talking about getting sober, and the guy I'm shooting pool with used to go to meetings at the AA clubhouse in town. I mean, I'm just, I'm in the dewdrop in surrounded by people talking about AA and meetings, thinking this is, this is not what I meant, you know. And, uh, and I mostly didn't drink in early 88, but the guy I was staying with had a bad back and he had pain pills, which never did a thing for me. But I would take two twice a week just in case they worked this time because I was ever hopeful, you know. And uh, and when he went out of town and took his pills with him, I drank. And I was as surprised as anybody. I mean, they tell you in treatment you're just substituting drugs for alcohol. But I really just always thought the people who couldn't handle their drugs either made that up to wreck it for the rest of us. Because, I, <laughs> you know, I didn't forget where my car was most of the time if I was doing drugs um, most of the time. But I, you know, and, and let me stop and say, too, I mean, I'm a child of the 70s. 
I always laugh when treatment centers say, what's your drug of choice? Because my drug of choice was yours. Um, <laughs> you got it. Sounds good to me. And uh, But I didn't struggle with where I belonged when I got here because as my alcoholism progressed, every one of those drugs started to interfere with my drinking. Every one of them. And one by one by one by one, I put drugs down because they interfered with my drinking. And anything that interferes with my drinking has to go. So, you know, some of these, they just meant I blacked out at 6 o'clock instead of midnight, which is bad news if you're up till 2, you know. And, uh, and the, the I'm not drinking drug just had too many legal penalties associated with it. And the only thing I ever miss occasionally is the diet pills because it's the only time in my life that I was, you know, I, I could drink for days. I was skinny, and my house was clean. <laughs> I never could get all that going at once. But uh, anyway, I, I am. I, there, there's not a doubt in my mind that I suffer from alcoholism. You know, I I, uh, I have my recreational drug decade, but you know, they uh, when they bottom line is they got in the way of my drink, and they had to go too. So as did my children, as did my employability, as did my integrity, integrity, it all went. It all went in the name of a drink. Every relationship, every goal. You know, I found myself in detox at age 29. I had run off to Florida again because I one day I woke up and thought, I bet they're all going down there just going, God, I wish Beth would come back, you know, because I'd been gone four years. And, and I got down to Florida and nobody was very excited to see me. And then I didn't have money to get back, so I... You know, and I'm in the Fort Myers airport on June 26, 1988, and I didn't even have a dollar. I didn't have enough for one beer, because if I can get one, I can get two. But I just couldn't bear the thought of being asked to leave the bar, because it would have been obvious I was looking for somebody to buy me a drink in the airport bar. And I thought about, you know, they didn't have debit cards and cell phones back then, so I thought about just trying to snag a purse from a little old lady and maybe get some cash so I could get a beer. But I was so, so hungover, and I knew I would pick on the little old lady that did aerobics twice a week. <laughs> She'd run me down and take her purse back, and I, I just didn't have the energy to fight, so, or lose to a 70-year-old. Um, so, so I called Mommy, you know, because what else are you going to do, and uh, said, told her where I was, what I had done, asked if I could come home. She said, I don't know, and, and she hung up. She said, call me later, click. Apparently, she'd been talking to her friends in Al-Anon. And uh, <laughs> so I called her back a couple hours later, and she said, I booked you a plane ticket, but I need you to understand I'm not really flying you home. I'm flying the children's mother home, and it's only because we're afraid we'll never see you again if I don't. And I got on the plane, you know, and thank God, thank God she had friends in Al-Anon. Because when I got there that night, I hadn't had a drink all day. I didn't know that was going to be my sobriety date. I'm sure I would have at least tried to get one last drink on the plane. I didn't know I was going to be sober, you know. She picked me up at the airport. She drove me straight to the county detox at midnight and, uh, and said, go in or don't, but you can't come home with me. And again, I didn't give a thought as to what that might have cost her. I'm her only child. That county de detox was in over the Rhine in Cincinnati, which had, back in the 80s, was, there was a lot of violence there. It was hitting the national news for violence. It was hitting the national news because women were disappearing down there. And, and when she drove away into the night, she didn't really know if she'd ever see me again or not. But she knew she had to leave me there and go. And thank God she did because my favorite game was always let me make it your job to see that I get my work done. You know, I'll do it when the pressure's really on, but until then, you really need to hound me or it's not going to happen. And I did that clean in my room. I did that with teachers and homework. I tried to do that with sponsors in AA. They don't play right. Um, <laughs> apparently, there were other people around who wanted to stay sober who called their sponsors instead of wondering why their sponsors weren't calling them. And uh, so I'm in detox. The next day, I wake up. And I'm kind of pondering my situation, and I realized I was 29 and a half years old, and I had no plans for being 30. I just never thought I'd live to see 30. I shouldn't have. I should have been dead over and over and over. I mean, I've been drinking and driving since I was old enough to drink and drive. I rode motorcycles drunk. I've been mixing drugs and alcohol since I was 15 years old. I bartended in places where people shot at each other. You know, I drank with very tall people that carried weapons when they drank, which is never a good plan. You know, I mean, I just should have been dead over and over and over. And I'm in detox at 29 and a half years old, just distressingly healthy. You know, I mean, just nothing wrong with me except, you know, rampant alcoholism. And, uh, I mean, my blood pressure wasn't even up. And, uh, and I just realized, you know, 
If you had told me, Beth, if you walk out of here and drink, you'll be dead in six months, make no mistake, I would have walked out and gotten the beer. Dying didn't scare me. What happened to me in that detox bed is that a voice came out of nowhere and just said, People like you don't die, Beth. And I knew it was true. I knew that no matter how bad it was right then, it was going to get worse, and then it would get worse. And there were levels of worse I knew about, and I knew there were levels beyond that I didn't want to know about. But one thing I knew with absolute certainty right then is no matter how bad it was, it would continue to get worse for the next 40 or 50 years if I kept drinking. I knew I wasn't going to die, and that scared me to death. I, uh, I never thought I would use this as an example, and don't call PETA on me, but when I got to the South, somebody was talking about how you go about boiling a frog. And like I said, I never thought this would be useful, but s stick with me here. If you throw a frog into a pot of hot water, it jumps out. Wouldn't you? You know, but if you put it in a pot of cold water and turn up the heat, he adjusts. You just turn it up a little. And then you turn it up a little more and he adjusts. And you turn it, or she, I don't know. Turn it up a little more, the frog adjusts. Turn it up a little more. And suddenly the frog's in boiling water and never knows what happened. Now, isn't that alcoholism, really? I mean, isn't that what happens to us here? We come in, and the water's fine. And then it gets a little hot, gets a little worse, but we adjust. And then it gets a little worse, but we adjust. And it gets a little worse, but we adjust. And then about the time we might do something about it, we rally a little. You know, we never come back up to where we were, but we come up a little, just enough to go, oh, my God, I almost went to AA. Talk about overcorrecting, you know. Whoa, whoa, whew. And then it's worse again, you know. And that day I knew that's what my alcoholism looked like, that it would just continue to descend into the depths of hell. And... Uh, and I just had this passing thought, you know, that whatever those people in AA were doing seemed to be working for them, and the, the AA on the Beth plan was not working for me. And so I just thought, well, maybe I ought to just go do what they do. I had no, now I thought I'd go down in flames. I was a biker for God's sakes, you know. I just never knew my big surrender was going to be, maybe I ought to do what they do. <laughs> Screw it. You know, but uh, I I got out of detox on Friday, a 4th of July weekend. I made a, arrangements to go into a hotel for women. That should have been a sign of surrender there. And uh, But I couldn't do anything until the following Tuesday. I got out on Friday, July 1st. The 1st was on Monday, or the 4th of July was on Monday. My life was on hold until Tuesday. My car was impounded, which in hindsight is why going to Florida seemed like such a good idea that day. I had charges pending that I wasn't sure, but I figured they had to do with the car being impounded. You know, I could put that together. And, uh, and, and I couldn't get into this hotel for women until Tuesday. I couldn't get my car until Tuesday. I couldn't do anything until Tuesday. And I knew if I went to Norwood where I lived, I would drink. I knew that. And I managed to scrape up enough money to get a cheap hotel. And hotel is a loose term, but any of you in Cincinnati people, Drake Motel on Reading Road. They had a pool, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> I know where you drank. Uh, so anyway, I got a room at the Drake because the bus stopped right in front, and I could just ride it down Reading Road. Didn't have to turn. Didn't have to change buses. Somebody else would probably be talking if I'd had to get a bus transfer. And uh, and I just had to ride it straight down Reading Road, walk one block, and I was at the AA clubhouse. And uh, and I almost didn't go the first night because i have been going all week in detox. I could take a night off, you know. But one voice in my head said, you know, you skipped meetings before and you drank. Maybe you should just go. So I walked out and I got on the bus and I rode it down to 405 Oak Street. And they had a speaker meeting at 830 and I stayed for that. And the woman speaking I had met when I had been driving by other years. And there she sat four years sober. And she told a whole room full of people that alcoholism, not drinking, but alcoholism, had taken her to a point in her life where she didn't want to take care of her daughter. She just wanted to drink. And I couldn't believe she was telling a room full of people what was my biggest secret. Because you cannot tell people you don't want your children. That Just talk about looking bad, you know. It's just not the kind of... Even when I would not drink for a day or two here and there and maybe have a half-decent day, my head would be almost to the pillow and the committee would convene and say, yeah, but you don't even want your own kids. What is wrong with you? You know, and, and uh, the noise would just start again. And she's telling a whole room full of people that. 
So I got her number after the meeting, and I stayed for the midnight meeting. Thank God they had midnight meetings because I was a bar drinker. And then I found somebody to take me back to the motel, and the next day I got up and I went back down, and now I'm on, like, day two out of detox, so I'm probably a whole week sober. And I already have a plan, you know, because if you sit in the back, we know you're new. And uh, if you sit in the front row, you might have to talk to people. So I sat in the second row. The AA Clubhouse in Cincinnati was a, an old house that had been converted. So I sat second row against the wall. So now maybe I only have to talk to one person. And, uh, you know, my plan is working so far. But now it's time to say the Lord's Prayer. And I got a wall over here. I don't have a hand to hold. The committee launches. You are such a loser. Nobody likes you. They can just tell looking at you that you're a loser. You can't even say the Lord's Prayer right. No hand to hold. Loser. You know, and so I'm just hanging my head, and that's really all it would have taken for me to not go back the next day. That is all it would have taken. And whoever was in the front row turned around and took my hand, and to this day, I don't know who that was. But I got to tell you, they are the reason I came back on Sunday. You know, things like that are 12-step work, too. We talk about, you know, we, we start thinking about 12-step work as going out and working with wet drunks and sponsoring 800 people. But 12-step work is as simple as remember a new person's name. You know, God, I wanted you to know who I was, but I didn't even know that's what I wanted, so I couldn't have asked. You know, and when they took my hand, they did not speak a word, but they gave me a message of Alcoholics Anonymous, which is you are not alone and you don't have to do this by yourself. And because of whoever that was, I came back on Sunday. And if you're ever circling up and, and I'm looking around, it's like I will not start praying until I know every hand has another hand to hold because it is just one of those things. Alcoholism can make you feel alone in a room full of people. You know, it can isolate me in a crowd still, still. It's just now if I get to a room and I want to run, I go greed instead. If you're new and you want to run, just park yourself at the door and greet. When I moved to North Carolina, I was 14 years sober. It's all of them and me again, and I just parked at the door. They go, oh, I didn't know we had greeters at this meeting. I'd be like, we do now, you know. <laughs> Because if you're greeting, it gives the appearance of talking to people, but there's no real danger of conversation because they're all on their way for coffee. So, But it's enough to get me to stay until the meeting starts, and then I can go sit down. And usually if I'm greeting, then somebody will come say, can you read the steps? And now I can't leave because how would that look? And then I have to go read the steps, and then bingo, by the time the meeting's over, I feel better. Funny how that works. So anyway, I came back because they, uh, you know, somebody took my hand, and... Um, on Sunday, I came back, and I was kind of in a panic because that night the meeting was at 7.30, and there wasn't a midnight meeting because it was Sunday, and the clubhouse closed at 10, and the bars were still open till 2, and I didn't know what I was going to do. And when I walked in, a lady grabbed my hand before the meeting and said, don't go anywhere after the meeting. We're going to the movies. She didn't say, do you have any money? She didn't say, do you want to go? Because if she would said, do you want to go, I would have said no, you know, and then really hoped she asked me again because I did want to go, but I didn't want to look too anxious, you know. So... Uh, <laughs> She just said, we're going to the movie. So the meeting's over. We hung out, had a cup of coffee, went to 10 o'clock show of Roger Rabbit, which, as you know, is about eight hours long. So it got me <laughs> got me through till the bar closed. And, uh, and I laughed. God, I laughed, you know. And so I just started going every day. I just started going every day. I went to a Big Book meeting at noon. They had a, a meeting called Noon Big Book, cleverly named. And they read an entire chapter at that meeting of the Big Book. They read the preface and the forewords at one meeting. They read the doctor's opinion at the next. And then they read chapters 1 through 11 and started over. So every 13 days, I was hearing the first 164 pages of that book and hearing people talk about how they were applying it sober in their lives. And for me, that was so much better. They didn't read the steps and the traditions and how it works and everything because they were reading the whole chapter. They would read the first paragraph of the forward to the first edition. You know, we of Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. To show others how we have recovered is the precise, you know, precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this book. And then they would read a chapter and then they would talk about it. Now, I went because my many trips to treatment, I knew that you should read your book every day and I thought this would count. Because um, if I did try to read at home, you know, my brain was sawdust. And if I tried to read at home, either I'd been staring at the same paragraph for 10 minutes or I was 20 pages in and had no idea what I read. And even in the meeting, when they're going around reading, I could barely stay on the page. So, you know, it'll be like, war fever ran high in a new, I wonder what it's going to cost to get my car out of impound. I better call that guy after the meeting, you know, and then I would hear the page turn and I would come back. But I started to hear it, you know, and, and uh, 
I would do, you guys probably never did this, but like they would go around the room in an orderly fashion and read. So when it started getting close to me, I'd start, I'd count, you know, and see which paragraph's going to be mine to be sure I can pronounce everything in it and, you know, look good doing it. And, uh, cause I mean, some paragraphs, you know, I mean, like say you get how it works. I mean, rarely have we seen a person, fa- rarely have we seen a person fail. Rarely have we seen a person fail. I mean, you know, the possibilities are endless. And, uh, <laughs> So I'd be ready. I'd be ready. I've counted. They're coming around. It's almost my turn. I'm ready. And then Helen reads two paragraphs, throws the whole thing to crap. <laughs> and I have to read unrehearsed. <laughs> it's hard being me. But, you know, I went to this meeting because I wouldn't have to read at home. I went because it's at noon, so my day's free at one. Yay. You know. And I went because they read a whole chapter and that chewed up half of the hour, so maybe I wouldn't get called on to talk, not realizing they didn't really care about my five days of experience, strength, and hope. Um, <laughs> but what happened was my day's free at 1, but by 4 o'clock, I remember I have no life. So I'd be back there at 6.30 for the 8.30 meeting because I just didn't know what else to do with myself. I knew if I went home and turned on the television, I wouldn't leave. So I would just, you know, go through my stuff. I'd gotten a little efficiency apartment. I could see the clubhouse out my window. And I would just go dump my stuff and then run up to the clubhouse and, and sit there for two hours till the meeting started. And um, so, you know, I'm doing two meetings a day a lot. And, and the other thing that happened, while people who go to big book meetings on purpose, unbeknownst to me, tend to be the ones who read the book and do what it says. So I had unwittingly plopped myself into the middle of those active people in Cincinnati AA. They just sucked me in. I didn't stand a chance. I mean, they, they had me answering phones at intergroup twice a week by the time I was 10 days sober, you know. Tuesday and Friday, and I can't drink in between there because I never could only drink for three days, so I would have to, and they had me convinced nobody else could, they were computerizing, they were digitizing their meeting schedule, 500 meetings they were putting into electronic format, and she had me convinced I was the only one allowed to touch the computer, (laughs) you know, so of course I I have to go because they need me, you know. (laughs) But the really, the, the funny thing that happened was, I realized that some of it was sinking in even when I wasn't paying attention. My mom had put me to work answering phones for her because I was unemployable otherwise. But I could go work a couple hours and then go to this noon meeting. And I think about three weeks sober, I was on my way back to her office, and I stopped in Walgreens to run an errand. And I popped up to see what everybody was talking about because, I mean, they're still up there now. I just don't check in with them very often. And uh, I popped up, and somebody in my head is going, that was so cool what Guy said at the meeting. And somebody else is going, I know I didn't even know that was in the book, did you? And somebody else is like, I didn't know that was in the book either. And I just remember thinking, the voices in my head are getting sober, you know? (laughs) It's a good sign if they're up there discussing the meeting without you, you know what I mean? It's like... My sponsor said, appoint a sober chairperson and just get out of there. So that's, I just try to keep the gavel in the hands of the sober one now. So every now and then the drama coach grabs for control, but mostly I can keep the sober one in charge. So, you know, this is all going on. I start taking my kids to AA meetings. My biggest fear when I got sober was what I even know how to love my children. I didn't know if alcoholism had just crushed the ability to even do that. I, that was a huge fear of mine. And I would get my kids on weekends, and I didn't know what to do with them, so I brought them to meetings because I knew I'd yell at them all weekend if we just had to sit in my little apartment. So my kids did four to five meetings a week from Friday to Sunday. I always smile when people tell me they can't go to meetings because they have kids. I'm like, ah, yes, you can. <laughs> my kids did four meetings a week from Friday to Sunday. And uh, But you know what happened is when I brought them, you guys taught me how to talk to my kids. You would sit down before you talked to them so they could look you in the eye because they had become invisible around me. You know, if you're between me and a drink, you're either invisible or you are plowed down. And my children had become invisible. They would talk, and I didn't hear a word they said. And you guys sat down and made eye contact, and you called them by name. I always try to make it a point to learn the names of the small children at meetings, you know, because my kids, their gaze came up off the ground. They began to look the world in the eye. They started to be okay. You know, and it took a year. At a year sober, we went to a picnic, and... um, you know, when we got there, I said, if you want to play, go ahead. And they never did. They usually just hung with me, which was fine. I only had them on weekends. But this was like, I was about a year sober, and my son was seven, and we'd been there about half an hour, and he tugged on my leg, and he said, Mom, I just wanted you to know, if you need us, we're over here playing. You know, and, and uh, Bill Cropper in Greensboro says that grace is that minute when we see everything exactly the way it is. And what I realized right then is those that it took a year, but my kids knew that day 
that they could let me out of their sight and I would be there when they got back, that they did not have to stay glued to my side to keep me in their line. You know, they, they could let me out of their sight and it would be okay. And that took a year. I was really grateful for that, you know, and I was really grateful that I knew that's what had happened. And so we kept going to meetings, you know, another thing that, um, that happened early was, uh, I guess I was out of detox about a week and I was at the Friday night meeting again and they passed a second basket because a member of that Friday night group had lost his daughter to a drunk driver that day. She was nine years old and she was hit head on by a, a drunk driver. And the next Tuesday, Charlie was at that big book meeting that I was going to. And I couldn't believe he was there five days after losing his daughter. And he talked about how it happened. And in Cincinnati, if you got a DUI, you had to go do a three-day weekend at Drake Hospital. This is on Galbraith Road, which is a two-lane road. And that's what you did to satisfy the courts. And this, uh, these cars were drag racing on Galbraith Road, side by side, hit the car she was in head-on right outside Drake Hospital. And those people doing their DUI weekend were outside on break when it happened. And Charlie said, maybe one of them will get sober and this wasn't for nothing, you know? And when I left that day, I was just thinking about that because I thought, what if I had been driving that car? What would my kids have been left with? What kind of memories of me, you know? And because I always wanted a do-over. And it was like, it was one of those times when the sky got bluer and the, the trees got greener. And this, this voice just came and said, you know, you have been given the gift of a second chance. And gift is not a word I ever use in the same sentence with Alcoholics Anonymous, especially not at a week sober. But I realized, you know, that right there, right then, I might never, ever have custody of my kids again. I might be a weekend mom forever, but that I could be a good weekend mom if that was the deal. I could be where I was supposed to be when I said I would be there because my word was worth nothing to those kids. And I think it was the first time, really, that I ever was content to be where I was and build forward instead of wanting to go back and start over with a clean slate. And I started to participate in my kids' lives, you know. And I, uh, I saw Charlie when I was a year sober, and I got to tell him how much my life had changed that day when he said that, and we both cried, you know. And I, I'm not arrogant enough to say, you know, it wasn't for nothing because it changed my life, but it changed my life when it happened because you just never know. You just never know, you know. I, what I, my prayer since I got sober has always been, God, let me hear what you're telling me and let me see what you're putting in front of me. I never asked him to show me things or tell me things because I kind of figured he always had been, and I'd just been too self-absorbed to notice. So my prayer is always, let me hear what you're telling me. Let me see what you're putting in front of me. Let me notice what you're doing in my life. And, uh, you know, my life just took off. By the time I was three weeks sober, somebody said, Beth, you've been around before. Why don't you just write an inventory? And I didn't know I could say I wasn't ready, or whoa, a step a month, or whatever, you know. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> So I just wrote it, you know, because um, they pointed out to me the big book. Sometimes I'll be teaching a class in a treatment center, and every now and then somebody will say, how do you know when it's time to get sober? And I just go, God, you're going to hate yourself when I tell you, you know, because, like, you're probably talking to your friend when it gets read at every meeting. If you have decided you want what we have and are willing to go to any lengths to get it, you are ready to take certain steps. It doesn't say anything in there about being a year sober first. I was ready. I had decided I wanted what they had. And I wrote that inventory at three weeks sober. By the time I was four weeks sober, I'd done a fourth and fifth step. That woman that didn't want her kids became my sponsor. My life took off, and I have never looked back. And I'm so grateful that I fell in with people who read the book and know what it said. Because I could not have gone two months or four months or six months without writing that inventory. There was too much noise in my head. And I had to be free and make some room for God to move around. So I started showing up. I did two meetings a day, probably for two and a half years, because I could, you know. And when I was a year sober, my mom and I talked and decided there really was no good purpose served in the kids coming to live with me because at, at a year sober, they had been with her for four years in a blue ribbon school district in a clean, safe suburban neighborhood. I was in a 10th floor efficiency apartment in a crappy section of town. It wouldn't have been in their best interest to come live with me. And I was lucky that my mom had them, you know. I know sometimes the kids are in the system, and you can't leave them where they are. But I, uh, in, in Cincinnati, girls have two years to get their kids out of the system, and sometimes they'll be four months sober, and, the, and they start getting pressured to take their kids back. And, and I, I, you know, this is my opinion. This is not a, you know, policy. But at four months sober, I was going to two meetings a day and working for almost nothing. And if my kids had come home, I, what am I going to do, not work to spend time with them? No, I would have had to skip meetings. So, you know, they stayed with her, and we determined that I would catch up to them in their neighborhood because they were doing what they were supposed to do. I was the disruption. They were doing what they were supposed to do. 
So I started going back to school part time. I kept working for her so I could go take a class during the day. You know, my mom, who never did anything for me and still had my kids, hired me, employed me, taught me a career. I'm a CPA now. And she let me go back to school during the day from her office so that I could go to meetings at night. And I was a year sober before that woman asked me if I could watch the kids on a Thursday night so that she could go sing with the chorus she wanted to sing with. She waited a year before she kept them, you know, stopped keeping them seven nights a week. And, you know, I, I, I'm embarrassed to tell you how long it took me to remember things like that because I had a whole list of all the stuff she did wrong, but I, uh, I was never tuned in to what she did right, and there was a lot of it. But, you know, I guess it's like having your radio. There's always 80 stations out there, but you only hear the one you're tuned into. And, uh, and I have had to do some retuning since I got sober and find new stations to listen to. And um, so, you know, by 15 months sober, I've got a driver's license, a car, and insurance all at the same time, I'll have you know. <laughs> I'm starting to worry about my son because there's a lot of women in his life, you know, me and my daughter and my mom. And I thought really for his sake, I probably should start looking around for a guy because a little guy like that needs a man in his life. And... <laughs> Hey, that's the kind of loving, giving mom I am. <laughs> it was around Thanksgiving, and uh, so I was probably a year and a half sober. They always did a big spread at Oak Street. That was the AA clubhouse at 1 o'clock, so we went to Noon Big Book because that's what I do. And uh, at 1 o'clock, I came out, and I couldn't find my son, and somebody said, oh, they're across the street. And I looked, there was a schoolyard across the street, and there's my 7-year-old son, another 7-year-old boy, and four of the guys in their 20s over there playing football. And I thought, well, where else should a boy be on Thanksgiving Day except playing football with a bunch of guys? But the grace of that was realizing that I didn't do anything to make that happen except go to Noon Big Book. I didn't set up his game for him. And for whatever reason, I realized right then if I did what I needed to do, his needs would be met too, that I didn't have to micromanage his life. So I called off the manhunt for a while. And <laughs> I had... Uh, I had heard this guy speak when I was around a year and a half sober. He had a year at the time, and he had never been to Oak Street before, and he came and talked. He gave a great talk. I never forgot his name. I tell him that when I heard him speak, I just said, I really want what he has, and I'm willing to go to any lengths to get it, you know. <laughs> yeah, we've been married 23 years. <laughs> But we actually, uh, he accused me of 13 stepping him, but he slowed down so I could catch him. <laughs> no, we actually, we didn't start going out for another year. So we, we were two and two and a half when we started going out. We got married a year and a half later. And uh, we were married 23 years in July. And we, you know, we have a great time. We have both stayed in the middle of Alcoholics Anonymous. We, Dick was his sponsor. You know, tomorrow when I drive up to Omaha, Chuck's flying to Omaha, and I'm picking him up at the airport up there so that we can go pay our respects to a man that saved his life. And, um, you know, because that's what we do here. That's what we do. We do Alcoholics Anonymous. We share with others. You know, there is not a step in that book that says, having had a spiritual awakening, we took it home and watched TV. Um, you know, AA is not convenient, but i got to tell you the consequences of my drinking were not particularly convenient either. And the more AA I do, the better my life is. You know, I find that if I am under four meetings a week, I rarely am under four meetings a week, but on those rare occasions when it happens, usually within a week or so, I don't have time to go to two. I mean, who does really, you know? But if I am doing four or five meetings a week, I have time to do everything, and I'm looking for another one, you know? And so I have stayed in the middle. I have stayed active. I've stayed busy. I've stayed sponsored. You know, Peg, Peg has been my sponsor 20 years, 20 of my 27 years. I've had, I've had a relationship with one person for 20 years, and... Um, you know, I have become a parent. We did get moved into the kids' neighborhood after we got married, and they started fifth and seventh grade walking out the front door of mom and dad's house like all their friends, you know. Two years after that, we're saying, you wanted them back, you wanted them back, you wanted them back, you wanted them back, because they, uh, they were teenagers. And it was ugly. And, uh, you know, but they lived through it, we lived through it. And now those children that were four and six when I got sober are 33 and 31. And they have grown up around Alcoholics Anonymous. I have an eight-year-old granddaughter that thinks I walk on water, and I am not telling her different. <laughs> I'm a responsible pet owner. I haven't killed a plant for four years. Sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. So. <laughs> I have a driver's license still that has my name on it, you know. I have a mortgage. God help me. Um... You know, I've learned to do all of that here. This is where I learned to show up. This is where I learned to grow up. 
This is where I learned to participate in my life and the lives of others. This is where I noticed that there were other people on planet Beth, you know. This is where I found out that what I've been looking for my whole life was really to just be a child of God. You know, Chuck Chamberlain always said, we are all God's children. We should act like it. You know, and I interpret that as play nice with the other kids. That's what the end of my email says, play nice with the other kids. And I just, you know, I, I didn't know I wanted to be a child of God. I thought I wanted to be the best or the worst, not one of many in the middle. But my strength is being one of many in the middle. And if you are new here, you know, you have just walked into the biggest family reunion of the children of God that you will ever see. We laugh here. We cry here. We grow up here. You know, we have kids here. We've been in Cary 12 years now. And so the young people that were 20 when we first moved there, they're all like 30 and having kids now. So it's like the whole little next wave of little alcoholics is coming along. It's awesome. <laughs> so if you're new, you know, we say keep coming back. But I like to say just stay. <laughs> Staying is so much easier than coming back, you know. And, uh, and enjoy the picnic with the children of God. It is a huge family reunion. And just play nice with the other kids. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.